Cool. All right, so I'm here today to talk about HCatalog, and uh, which provides a table management layer for Hadoop. So let me start by just introducing myself. Um, I am one of the founders at Hortonworks, uh, formerly from Yahoo. I've worked on Hadoop stuff, different parts of the Hadoop, Hadoop ecosystem for about five years now. I uh, started out mostly on Pig, still do a lot of work on Pig. The last year or two, been spending a lot of time on HCatalog as well, and now I actually lead the team that works on um, Pig Hive and H Catalog at Hortonworks. Um, so, what is H Catalog and why should you care about it? Let's uh, start with a little motivation there. So, one thing that I've observed in my uh, time working with Hadoop is there's a lot of different tools that people use on Hadoop for different use cases, right? So, just to pick, you know, three of the uh, of the more popular ones for data processing, we see people doing their data processing with traditional MapReduce, right? Um, early on, this is what almost everybody used because it was what there was. Um, nowadays, people tend to go to one of the higher layers often. Um, they end up using something like Pig or Hive or Cascading or something to that effect just because writing and, you know, reinventing all the operators and all the operations you want to do in plain Java gets a little old after a while, and since there's good uh, solutions out there, people tend to start using those. But there's still a few things you're going to do in, in traditional MapReduce, right? Some algorithms that aren't going to fit in those other tools, and some things where you need to be able to eke out every last bit of performance, and you don't want to incur the, um, some of the slowdown that you're going to take with those tools, right? Then there's... Uh, tools like PIG that are for data processing, for ETL, for describing long pipelines of operations. And then, of course, there's Hive, which gives a SQL type interface on top of Hadoop. And what we see is often people will come to Hadoop and they'll pick one of these to start with. And, you know, at least in my experience, about 80% of people start with Hive because it's SQL and it looks familiar and they already know SQL. And, hey, this is great, I can take Hadoop and I can turn it into a, basically a giant database, right? Um, some people do start with Pig. They like its procedural approach. Maybe that's a better fit for their use cases. But over time, almost everybody ends up adopting at least one other of these tools, right? Because eventually you discover, you know, now that I have this huge system and I have all this data, there's all kinds of things I can do to it, that do with it that I didn't envision when I started. Right, But whatever tool you chose, it eventually turns out it's not the right tool for these new use cases. So if you start with Hive, um, you know, it works great for all your analytics, ad hoc queries, all that kind of stuff, but pretty soon you discover, you know what, I'd like to do some work where I build, where, where I have a big long pipeline that builds a complex data model that consists of you know, 50 or 100 different data processing steps along the way. And it turns out Pig is a good fit for that, and you can do that in SQL, but it's a little more painful. Um, or, you know, if you start with Pig the other way around, you might have started building those big data models, but pretty soon you realize, you know, I'd like to have SQL so that all my data analysts who aren't necessarily comfortable learning a new language can use SQL against this. So everybody ends up with these mishmash of tools, right? In one way, this is, I, I strongly feel this is a strength of Hadoop because you're not saying there's only one door. I think this is one of the places where Hadoop has really been a, a nice advance over some of the, last gen, the previous generation of data tools where SQL was the one door. You know, SQL was the way you got to data and you, you, know, you had to like that, right? Um, so this is nice because now you can pick the right tool for your application. You're not bound to this is the only way to make things happen. But the downside is you end up with these sort of silos, right? You end up with fractured communities. People, some people say, oh, we're, you know, we're generating this data in Pig, and then somebody else says, oh, but we use Hive, so now we have to figure out how to get that data that you're creating in Pig and load it into Hive, right, or vice versa. So you end up with a situation where you have different users in your, uh, in your team that can't share their data, or at least they can't share it super easily. So this chart is an attempt to capture that plus add a few more things to it. 
it's not just that these sharing data between these tools is hard. These tools don't even think about data in the same way, right? So um, MapReduce thinks about data as a set of key value pairs. Pig and Hive think about them as tuples or records um, like a database server would. MapReduce doesn't give you any data model at all. You just impose on it whatever you want. Um, Pig and Hive both have data models. They're a little different, but they're hmm, pretty close. Once you learn one, it's a, a short trip to the other one. Um, and then there's a whole set of other things like, you know, what's the schema of this data? Where, where on my system did I store this data? What, how did I store this data? What format is it in? All that, if you have a metadata server like Hive has, all that's encoded for you, right? You don't have to track that. Um, if you're using MapReduce, PIG, Cascading, any of these tools that sit on top of just straight MapReduce, you have to know that, right? You you're basically end up encoding that in your application or writing it in your script. Um, so that means, one, that your users have to know quite a bit to write their applications. And it means, two, as soon as you make a change, um, say you decide that you no longer want to store your data in uh, text format, but that you're going to switch to use Hive's RC file format because it's, you know, a better fit for your use case. You can more tightly compress the data. You have a lot of queries that only read a few columns, so a columnar storage system is a good choice. Um, now you're forcing all your users, all your non-Hive users, to go rewrite their data, right? They may have to restate lots of data and they have to rewrite their applications. They have to go back through, um, they have to rewrite them, they have to retest them, they have to redeploy them. In a big company using a lot of Hadoop, you're signing up for engineering years worth of work, right? That's, that's not too cool. And then finally, as I've already mentioned, um, you, you have to be able to transition this data between users, right? When a MapReduce or PIG user is done with the data, the Hive user has to find that data, load it into Hive, um, and all that kind of stuff. So here's kind of the same picture graphically, right? This is, and the different colors here are to represent different tools. So over here on the left, we have MapReduce that uses input and output format to, to process the data. On the right side, we have PIG, which uses load and store functions and which cooperate with the same input and output format. And in the middle, we have Hive, which has a Metastore client, and it uses this SERTI here to translate the results of the input and output format so that Hive can make sense of them. And this little arrow here is to communicate that um, in Hive, the user is actually abstracted away from knowing what these are, right? You just select from a table or insert into a table, and Hive itself uh, queries its Metastore and says, okay, to talk to this table, I need this input format and this SERTI and it does that for you. But, but you see that basically we have three different things talking to HDFS through different channels, right? We have all these multiple code paths. Um, in addition to the inefficiencies I already mentioned, this also produces the inefficiency that if tomorrow you adapt a new, uh, a new storage format, you now have to write an input format, an output format, a SERTI, a load function, and a store function, right? The, the cost now to adding new formats to your system is getting pretty expensive. So these are the problems that HCatalog is written to address. This is exactly the use case it's going after. So it changes the picture to look like this. What HCatalog does is it opens up this Hive Metastore to other tools. Right now it's a MapReduce and PIG. All right, so it introduces an HCAT input and output format and an HCAT load and store function so that from um, PIG and MapReduce now, you can benefit from this metadata, right? So one of the strengths of systems like PIG and MapReduce are you don't have to have metadata, right? You can work with data that you don't necessarily want to load into your system or clean up to fit in metadata, any of those things. but. Um, and that's great, and sometimes that's useful, but when the metadata is there, you'd like to be able to make use of it, right? So this, that's what this opens up. So here's that same uh, chart again, this time with th these tools with HCatalog. So you notice now, in the MapReduce, this is creating a data model 
for these MapReduce users, right? They don't have to basically create their own data model to deal with this. And now in this section, PIG and MapReduce can benefit from the schema and data location and all that abstraction information so they don't have to be aware of what that looks like, right? So um, that now insulates PIG and MapReduce users from all this very specific information that they had to know before about their data. And it also means that data is visible to everybody as soon as anybody's finished with it, right? If, if I'm a um, PIG user and I'm consuming data from somebody that creates it with MapReduce, as soon as they write that data out and commit it into the Metastore, it's available to me, right? I, can, I will be able to see it. So let's walk through what that might look like here. Um, so we'll do pig first and then we'll take a look at MapReduce to just kind of show how it changes. So on the top uh, part of the screen here we have a traditional pig Latin script. And if you don't know pig already, that's totally fine. But this is where you'd load the data and notice you have to give the file name and you end up declaring the schema, right? You have to tell, you don't have to tell pig. Pig is fine if you don't know the schema and don't tell it, but um, if you want to work with columns by name and if you want to declare data types and that kind of thing, you have to tell pig what your schema is. And then you do your processing and when you're finished, you store it. And again, you store it in some known location, right? So we, we've encoded all that uh, location specific information in this script. Down here in HCatalog, by using Hive's table abstraction for it, we're able to remove a lot of that. Now the pig user just says, I'm selecting from this table called raw events. I don't know where that is. I don't know what format it's in. Right? I, I don't have to understand that. All I have to do is know that it's in the Metastore and I use this HCAT loader and other stuff is taken care of for me. And you notice now you can use these column names without having declared them. Pig can read that um, through it through the HCAT loader function. Um, Pig can get that information. Also notice that we're passing partitioning information here. So up in the top here, if you assume this is like some collection of data called raw events, and this is the date, right? So this probably means pull all the records from May. Tw um, Sorry, I forgot I was presenting in Europe and I still did it in US format. This is you know, all the uh, days from May 30th for 2012, right? If you, um, down here, you can put this in your filter, right? You don't have to, um, you don't have to know that location and Pig is still smart enough to say, oh, this is, um, DS here is a partitioning column on this table, so I'll strip this part of the filter out and I'll pass it down to H catalog so that we only have to scan the proper sections of the table, right? So it can still do partition pruning and all that as it reads. And then um, you come down here to the end and again you just store into a table and it's all good. So let's see, I think I've already pointed this out. So yeah, you don't have to know where the file is, you don't have to declare the schema, you can put in this filter. So now let's talk for a minute about what it would, um, what this would look like with MapReduce. So in general, your MapReduce program isn't going to change that much. You're just going to use a different input and output format. So this is HCAT input format. When you are configuring your job, you need to tell it where am I going to read my data from, right? So in this, you declare what what database. In, you're going to read from. So that's Hive has a concept of databases. Also, they can be called schemas, same thing. Um, so you can tell it if you leave this null, then you'll get the default database, which is what I think about 99% of the people use. Um, you tell it this is the table I want to read from, and this is the filter I want to apply to it. And this filter can only be partition specific. So you can't just say, well, I only want to see records where the user column is not null or something. That This isn't applying that kind of predicate. This is applying the uh, any partitioning predicate. So if you're partitioned on date stamp or on, um, I don't know, 
you know, what part of your website it came from or anything else like that, you can put that in here and you can that way limit what parts of the table you're reading, right? In a similar way, when you go to write out the data, you would use HCAT output format and you're going to set um, you're going to set up your output and again tell it the database name and the table name that just the same as before and the one difference here then is going to be what um, what partition are you going to write if you're going to write a particular partition if your table is partitioned you can declare that right here you can say okay this is going to the partition for today's date now if you're not um, I mean, your table may not be partitioned, in which case you can just leave this null. You can also leave it null if you have data for multiple partitions in here and you want to spread it across those partitions as you write. For example, you might be processing an entire week's data and you want to spray it out by day or something, or maybe you're processing a day's data and you want to partition it by hour. Um, that's totally fine. HCatalog will figure that out and it will just spray your data across those partitions as you write the data. So you don't necessarily have to know in advance where you want to write it to, right? You can also, in your MapReduce program, you can, uh, you can get the schema of the table so that you can, you know, you can learn things about the table. Now, the one kind of important safety tip here is you need to do this on your client when you're configuring your job, not in the Map and Reduce tasks. Um, HCatalog isn't scaled to the point that it's, it does well where if you start talking to it from map and reduce tasks, um, you know, if you've got 5,000 map tasks running all at the same time, which isn't that hard to accomplish in Hadoop, you don't want all those hammering your metadata store all at the same time asking for the same schema. Um, HCAT just isn't scaled to manage that. So this should be done on the client. And then if you're going to need it in, the, in your map or reduce tasks, you can store it in your job config and pass it along that way. Um, then once you're in these tasks, you can now refer to these items in these schema by name. So if you want to read this record, so when you set up your MapReduce job, your key will be whatever, it doesn't matter, each catalog doesn't uh, set the key to any particular value, or to any particular yeah, value, I guess. Um, your value type is HCAT record, which it just is basically a list, right? A named list. So you can now say, okay, get me the column in here that is the URL uh, column and read that out. So the nice thing here is the schema layout may change from partition to partition and you don't have to worry about it, right? You're, you're just asking for the column that is URL and um, HCAT worries about figuring out what column position that is and pulling it in. Now, let me add a little to that in that one of the things that's nice here is as people add new partitions, they may add new columns, right? And you, you don't want to be having to manage, okay, I know that this column exists in partitions after this date, but not in older partitions or those kind of things, right? So all that is, can be managed here. HCAP presents one schema to you as a user. And for data that has columns missing, if you ask for it, you'll just get a null, right? So if, say, you know, in this, example, in this example, the table that we're reading has a username and a URL. If tomorrow you add a, you know, a zip, or sorry, a, um, a region, where did this user come from? You know, are they from North America, from Europe, from Asia? If you add that in tomorrow's data set and somebody writes a, uh, a job that goes against both today's and tomorrow's data set and doesn't, you know, and it asks for the region, then for today's data set, they'll just get a null, right? They'll just be told that value isn't there. But HCatalog doesn't require you to go back and restate that data. It just handles on the fly the fact that the schema has changed. And the same for format changes. If you decide that you want to change the way your data is stored, that's totally fine since HCatalog stores the storage format with each um, partition there's no need to go back and restate your data. It can just handle the fact that older data is in, say, a text format and newer data is in RC file or sequence file or whatever you switch to. And all that can be done with no changes to your 
uh, Pig Latin scripts, your MapReduce jobs, all that, right? So you're insulating your developers from all the changes of how you do data layout. All right, I already talked about that. So, um, as I said before, this is H catalog pretty much takes Hive's Metastore and makes it available. So if you're already a Hive user, you know, if you install H catalog, there's nothing additional to do here, right? You, you can just use it as is. If you're not a Hive user, but you still find value in having some metadata in your system and being able to use that with your tools, Hive uh, H catalog does have a command line tool that allows you to use Hive's data definition language. So this is the part of SQL that lets you create tables, um, alter tables, drop them, show tables, all those kinds of things, right? So in, it looks almost exactly like Hive's command line, only it's HCAT instead of Hive. But again, if you're already a Hive user, you don't even need to use this. Just the Hive tools you have will already work. Um, and then starting with pig 0.11, you, you'll be able to issue these DDL commands from pig. It will, it's uh, integrated with hcatalog and can just direct those commands to the right place. That's, this is checked in in pig right now, but there hasn't been any 0 0.11 release yet, so it's not there. Okay. So I want to talk now a little bit about a piece we're actually adding. Everything I've talked about so far is already there. It's out in a released version of H catalog. I want to talk about something now that we're adding work we've done, but haven't. It's it's there in Ajira, but it hasn't been checked in and finished and all that yet. But I still think it's pretty exciting and useful. Which is, you'd like to be able to interact with this data through um, a nice REST interface, right? Instead of requiring um, a command line interface or APIs in specific languages, it'd be nice to be able to talk to the meta, your metadata and find out about it in a nice language independent way. And so we've worked on adding a, a REST interface for this. The endpoints for this REST interface at the moment are databases, tables, partitions, columns, and table properties. So each of those are treated as if they are an entity in the REST interface. And then you can use the standard REST verbs to operate on those, right? So if you put, you, you'll do a create or update on one of these. If you do a get, you'll get, uh, you'll either list the, all the existing ones of those or you'll get a description of a particular one or you can use a delete to drop. So let me walk through what that might look like with my neat little user art here. Um, so let's say that you want to get a list of all the tables in the default database. So that would look like this. You do a get on this address here, where you um, basically you're saying, you know, the database is default, and I just say table, but I don't give a name of a table, so I'm going to get a list of all the tables in that. And you get back a JSON document that looks something like this. So this, in this particular instance, we seem to have two, uh, two tables in this database called counted and processed. All right, so you get back a nice little JSON document. It can, your uh, program can process that. Um, of course, you can issue these in curl too, right? So that's actually how we do a lot of the testing. So you could just, if you're a user on the command line, you could um, just use curl, or if you're writing a simple app, you could use curl directly. Now let's say you want to, you know, you were really looking for a table called raw events. It wasn't in that list, so let's go ahead and create it. So in that case, you'd do a put, and you'd pass this JSON document that describes your table. And you, your URL is going to look pretty much the same, except now you've got a table name at the end of this, right? So you're addressing this to this uh, REST endpoint called raw events. And the stuff you're passing here is pretty basic. I want, two, I want columns, one named URL that's a string, one named user that's a string. And I'm going to partition this table by this DS column, date stamp column and it's going to be a string, all right? Um, so then it'll come back and say, here you go, I created a table called raw events, and I put it in the default database, and we're done. And of course, you know, if, some, if there was an issue, if there was already a raw events table or something else went wrong, there would instead be nice error information here that said what the problem was. All right, finally, now that you've created this table, let's um, 
describe what this, let's look at a describe of this, right? So before doing a get gave us a list because we said all tables. If you now do a get and you say, I want this table name, this raw events table, then you end up getting back this same, you know, pretty similar, it's not quite the same actually, JSON document that describes that table. And I seem to have left out the partitioning here, sorry, that's a mistake on my part because it should say that it's partitioned here as well. But anyway, so this, um, you know, again, lists the columns and what database it's in and the table name and all that stuff, right? So this gives you a nice way to interact with your metadata without um, needing to write command line code or, or any version, any language specific clients. Um, so as I said, this is not yet checked in. You can find it on this Jira here, hcatalog182. Um, it, the functionality is all there. It just needs some cleanup before we check it in. It's got some jars that are, aren't being pulled by Maven. They're instead just included in the patch and some things like that, that where we just need to do some housekeeping and stuff and then we'll get it checked in. Um, it will be uh, included in HDP from Hortonworks here uh, when that is released even though it's not in the 0 0.4 version. So let's talk a little, let's go back to HCAT itself and talk a little bit about where it's at. Um, it is in a, it's a project in the Apache incubator. So it's been in the incubator a little over a year now, I think a year and a month or two. Um, we just released version 0 0.4 last month. Uh, and oddly enough, 0 0.4 is our second release. Um, we only seem to do releases with even numbers. We did 0 0.2 and then 0 0.4. I don't know if our next one will be 0 0.6 or not, if we only count by even numbers for some reason. Um, this has everything I've shown you today except the REST interface. So it has you know, integration with HivePig and MapReduce. Um, it supports any data format that you have a CERTI for since it uses Hive CERTI. So this means you know, Hive already comes with stuff to manage CSV type data. Um, it, sequence files, RC files. We've actually written and included a CERTI for working with JSON data because um, that's something we find people want and use so that's included with the hcatalog release. It, we need to migrate that over to Hive. There really isn't a reason for that to be an hcat instead of Hive. It's just the way it is for the moment. Um, a feature I didn't talk about was hcatalog also enables uh, notification when your data is ready, right? So one of the problems that we see in a lot of systems is people don't know when their data is available, right? And what, so what do you do? You end up polling basically on the system to say, is my data there yet? Is it there yet? And that's not really good. That's not good for your name node. It's not good um, for, uh, you know, it's fairly brittle if your process that's polling dies or has some other problem. It can be hard to detect that. So we've added in uh, the ability to connect to a uh, JMS bus and hcatalog will publish a message when new partitions are added to a table so that you as a user can just subs um, connect to this JMS bus and say, I'm interested, you know, you, you basically, excuse me, you subscribe to a particular table and you say, I'm interested to know when new partitions are added to this table. And then if you're um, wanting to you know, every time a new partition is added, you need to go process it. You can just wait on that message and then go off and start doing your work. Um, and we've also done initial integration with HBase so that you can use HBase to store your data instead of HDFS. This piggybacks on top of Hive's connections with HBase, which, which is why I say initial. Those, I mean, it, it works. It's there, but it's, I would not call it mature yet. You know, there's still, I think, work to be done in both Hive and hcatalog communities to really harden this and make it a fully useful um, feature. All right. And I think with that, whoops, wrong direction, I will open it up for questions. Okay, at first, thanks, and for the talk. Um, oops. Um, how do you think that um, 
Avro integrates with that where the metadata is stored inbound instead of externally with a Metastore? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something, I, I don't think, I mean, you can make it work now by writing an Avro certy, but that doesn't really utilize the power of Avro, right? The power of something like Avro or um, any of these self-describing data formats is you can, you can let things, you can have data that is self-describing and that is variable, right? I mean, um, you know, if you may, this column may or may not exist for certain records and all that. That's, I think, one of the next things we need to really tackle and make work well, because that is a lot of the power of Hadoop is the ability to manage data that's only semi-structured or, you know, or where the structure is variable. Um, so I would say it, it doesn't work well together yet, but that's one of my next goals for this is to add that kind of stuff. I have a question uh, about the output for MapReduce jobs. Uh, um, is it also handling the uh, things with the retry and so on well, so that only files, valid files are moved to the right directions and so on? Because and normally you have only one output directory. So you, oh, we are, are you talking about when you partition on the fly or that kind of uh, stuff? If I, if, if I have a partitioned data store, Mm -hmm. And uh, if I have a normal a map reduced job, you, who goes to one output directory right. and creates the files, and afterwards I have to move it in the right dire uh, directory. Right, right. No, we, all that's taken care of for you. So H catalog totally manages where the data is placed. You, as a user, are uh, hidden from that. Right. I mean, that is sorry, that is hidden from you. <laughs> um, so you. Um, uh, yeah, there's no need to do that. You just say, write this data, and we'll worry about spraying that out where it's supposed to go. Yeah. And the second part is um, uh, with JMS notification. Mm -hmm. Do you plan to do an integration with OZ so that it can trigger pieces? Yes, that's, uh, OZ was the target project that this was done for, so I don't know. Um, originally, the OZ people told me they planned to add this integration in somewhere in the 3.0 line, which I know they're on now. I think they just did a 3.1. something release. Um, I don't know if they've gotten around to adding that feature or not, but that was, Uzi was explicitly what we were targeting when we added it. And actually, we'd like to even expand that to where it's not just JMS, right? Because, um, you know, I remember when I was talking to with some of the LinkedIn people about this, the first question they asked was, well, how come you didn't use Kafka instead, <laughs> right? And so what I think we need to do is really make that an interface where you can, it can be JMS, it can be Kafka, you know, whatever it is that you want to use, you just need to write a plugin and HCatalog will, will handle the notifications. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, any more questions? Okay. <laughs> Please wait. The distribution, which dis they, Hortonworks? Um, so the question is, when is the Hortonworks distribution going to be ready? And the answer is, um, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> I, I cannot uh, reveal that at the moment. <laughs> Uh, let's, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> yeah. Does it, does it impose any additional overhead when you Does it impose any overhead? That's a, yeah, a, a fair question. So I have not run the performance test recently. The last time we did it on input, we found like a 2% overhead or something to that effect. Um, now that was compared to pig. I don't know compared to, to MapReduce, but we work pretty hard to not actually change the data. So even though, like I showed you this HCAT record interface that we're using, that doesn't copy any data. It just casts a, you know, a shell around whatever the underlying input and output format are already using and does the inter uh, any kind of interpolation it needs to do on the fly. So it's pretty, we work hard to make it pretty minimal. Uh, can I create the additional metadata for existing Hive data? So if I already have lots of Hive data in my store mm -hmm. and want to read it with pig or something. Yep. It, it'll just be there. As soon as you um, connect 
as soon as you use like the HCAT loader and PIG, it will just see all those tables as they are. That I created and I have nothing else required, so. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, and now any questions? Okay, so thanks a lot again to Alan Gates from Hortonworks. Thank you.